Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmelzley. Hey, Glenn here. Today, we're going to hear a veteran of our profession give his unvarnished advice on making it as a marketer. I want to remind you that you can give me feedback on anything you've heard here or suggest who we should have on the show by reaching out on social using at Funnel Reboot or coming to FunnelReboot.com. Our guest came out of university not knowing what field he was going to go into, but he managed to get an internship at ad agency Saatchi & Saatchi. From there, he went to work at a variety of companies at a dream client, Penguin Books. He also worked on accounts like Budweiser and Sony PlayStation. He then settled into the online entertainment space, working with GoalPoker.com, JackpotParty.com. In between that and some unpublished novel writing, he found his real groove was giving advice on what young marketers could learn from things he had done. So after a career that's done just about everything that you could do agency and client side in marketing, he's now sharing his advice. A quick note, the audio isn't great. It's true that Harry's in the UK, but this sounds like it was done back in the 1930s on a transatlantic underwater cable. Let's go hear from Harry Lang. I am so glad to welcome Harry Lang. We're talking about a book. It's called Brands, Bandwagons, and Bullshit. Collated Advice and Cautionary Tales for Those Embarking on a Career in Marketing. Um, yeah, so the, the book came from the, the, the memory I had at the beginning of my career that um, there was no real advice available to, to young people looking at marketing as a, a true career opportunity, um, and I thought I could do something about that. So uh, that's why I collated uh, various stories together and added on uh, what I thought were good insights about starting a career and exploring the options and packaged them all together in the book. Sounds great. Um... Yeah, your own beginning was, uh, as you admit, um, not something that was too deliberate nor planned, um, but it did happen, and you found that your ability to roll with things was good because, as you say, in marketing, you never work the same day twice. No, yes, indeed. I mean, um, I think my, my entry into a marketing career was a process of elimination and realizing I wasn't clever enough to be a doctor or a lawyer. Right. Um, and I didn't have the, the patience to be or the num numeracy to be an accountant. And I ticked off the list and marketing and advertising were the exciting ones that remained. And I had no idea what those things really entailed until I got involved in it. So, um, so that was my start. And it, I think it's the start for many people as well. It is. And, uh, you know, so you lay bare some of the things that uh, we should be more upfront about uh, in marketing. Uh, of course, there are the people who go to the top uh, schools and go into the programs where they slip nicely into, let's say, the top agencies. But you took the starch out of it for me when you were saying that that formal marketing training, um, it, it, it's not all it's cracked up to be, meaning that if you have on your own, let's say, set up a website or posted social content or anything, you have as much right to claim that you can do the things that that highly trained person can do uh, because you've taught yourself. Yeah, I've, I've got to tread carefully on this, Glenn, because um, I, 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 the last thing I'd want to do is discourage people from taking advantage of formal training. I think right. there's an absolute benefit to it. However, like you say, you know, it's not available to everyone, and not everyone gets into a Unilever um, or a major Madison Avenue pro, um, advertising agency or, or, or somewhere where the training is available at university. It's not something everyone gets, uh, and that's not uh, a reason to discourage you from entering the industry. You know, for, for me personally, I lacked formal training early on uh, in agencies in particular. It was all cold face. It was all revenue generation. And you learn more because you were working twice the hours of anyone else in any other job. That was, <laughs> that was the upside. Right. Um, and later in my career, I've certainly leapt at any opportunity to get hold of formal training. But uh, I don't think people should be discouraged that um, without the formal training, they, they, they get left behind. I think actively pursuing those things like i mentioned in the book uh, about 
building a website, trying to get your first customer through the door, learning how to send an email campaign. You can do all those things by spending little, if any, money at all, and you will progress yourself as a marketer. So, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely two, two sides to it, and both of them have significant benefits. Uh, no doubt. Um, and yet there's no replacing uh, experience. It is the best teacher. Uh, Let's just talk about agencies here for a moment. You you do give them their due because you say there is no other place that is as fast paced with you know you call it multi client unhinged panic, uh, but but yet you know you can you can get other things out of an agency. What are those other things that you think an agency in particular will help a marketer with that going brand side just can't. Um, I think I think the spread of experience and the breadth of experience you get, you know, um, you, you might move into a client role and you'll probably be working on one brand. You might be working on one brand in one market. In an agency, you'll be working, and I'll take my indirect experience here, you might be working on um, a, a European nappy brand across 20 markets and 20 languages at the same wow. time as an alcohol brand when you're working 30 markets across 15 or 20 different channels. Uh, and then you might be called in to pitch on a piece of technology that hasn't been released to the world yet. And then you'll be called in to do a photo shoot and a, and a tiny zero budget ad campaign for a dog neutering charity. Uh, that was one year of my agency life. And you, you <laughs> simply won't get that breadth of experience in-house. So and for me, that's, that's the most significant win you can get out of an agency life. Yeah, uh, there's, um, yeah there, there's the breadth there. Uh, and it is going to call upon your best improvisation skills. Um, I think one thing that makes marketing uh, different than, uh, let's say, some you know pursuits where you have that breadth but are more artistic is that you know marketing has to reckon with dollars, and uh, this can sometimes you know irk marketers um, because it does impact, for example, things like the amount of salary that we will try to negotiate and command we have to remember that that salary was approved at a level at which the company would be making money off of your work but there are other things that i found you had a good take on just explaining that you know marketing in general some campaigns will work some campaigns will they that won't and the level the yardstick used to gauge that success frankly is dollars yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we we aren't here as a some sort of a holistic hobby project. No, um, it's a it's a commercial business, albeit one that balances commercial with creativity, and that goes all the way through from the creativity of, of building a strategy, all the way through to brands, architecture, and guidelines, all the way through to campaign creation and copy. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're not delivering value for clients as an agency, or not meeting your KPIs as a brand marketer. Um, you're probably not going to stay in a job very long, or at least not a very good one. So it, it's got to be remembered. And also on the, on the sort of financial recompense and the, the remuneration side, um, it, it's a popular job. You know, there's a lot of people who want to be marketers. You know, and at the early days, it can be a seller's market. However, that does change later in your career. As you accrue value, as you become uh, a greater expert in your field, you, know, you will find the financial rewards do increase. But uh, I think, you know, there's, there's a beauty in it. Um, there is always in every facet of marketing the need to maintain the creativity because um, down that route is where the money lies, you know, both for your clients or for your brand and for yourself. Yeah. It's the ability to think laterally and think creatively around problems uh, to generate the most significant ROI. And if you, if you start doing that consistently, I think you'll find you're a very popular hire. You seem to suggest, though, that we have to be okay with the paradox here. So we're there to make money, and yet we're also there to try. And trials of things may not succeed. Um, you, you know, were open about an e-commerce site that you built, uh, a fiction book that you mentioned earlier. You know, these things were trials, and maybe on a financial level they didn't succeed. And, you know, it's almost like we're stockbrokers that are being entrusted with a portfolio. But we've got to be open with the fact that this money that we're using, it's not monopoly money, it's real. But that we may have to use that same gameplay mentality and allow some of that money to be lost if that's what it takes for us to learn what's going to work. 
Yeah, no, indeed. I mean, I, I think I, I, I probably repeat the phrase fail fast um, too often in the book, but that, that's effectively where we all are these days as marketers. Not everything works. And you know, the, the other key thing to remember is marketing is never perfect, ever. And so in, in some respects, everything fails to a degree. Even the best campaigns could have been done better. Um, yeah, the examples you played there, from my own experience, is you know, putting a book together that made no money. That's, that's, that's no failure in my eyes. It was something I wanted to do. Uh, I did it. It was great fun. I had no real expectations. And I, I improved as a writer as a result of that. In the workspace, there are degrees of this. You know, um, in some channels, there is an expectation of an ROI from a certain spend. Now, if it completely tanks and you get zero ROI, no, that's pretty much unacceptable. You know, right. anyone who's a, a vague expert in PPC or, or paid social or display marketing should be able to get some semblance of ROI even from a, a rubbish campaign. Yep. Um, but if you want to start creating hero campaigns, the ones that really stand out and make a difference, then you've got to have an element of bravery. And whether you know, If you're an agency, you're the one proposing it and trying to influence the client and persuade them to take the risk. Ultimately, it's on their shoulders to make the gamble because it's their, it's their budget. Um, and you can facilitate that as an agency by demonstrating via data, by research, uh, by precedent historically that, that this risk is worth taking because of X, Y and Z reasons. Those campaigns are the ones that sort of step outside the norm and those are the campaigns that when they do go, they go big. And that's, that's the key thing, because you can go around doing you know, low differentiation, safe work all your career, and just tick along. And yes. you'll never leave a linear path of growth. If you, if you want to see something huge, and you want to show shareholders and stakeholders real return on investment, you need to step outside the comfort zone. But there's a way to do that cleverly. You know, there's a way to do that using the right people, using the right talent, using the right channels in balance at the right time and then creatively delivering something that's fantastic and really gets people, the customers, the people who, who, who tell you it's a success, getting them on side. And there's ways to do it. Uh, so it isn't just a question of going, yeah, hell, let's have a go. Um, no. It's a question of, hell, let's have a go with all this huge amount of work and effort behind the scenes. And it's, it's, it's akin to you know, the, the adage of the swan, it's beauty above the surface and it's mad paddling underneath. Right. That kind of, that kind of summarizes the marketer's life. Yeah, uh, and the, you're absolutely right. We have these fundamentals uh, that we must follow, but it's taking that best guess and leaping beyond that. I think the story that probably says it best for me is, I'd love to hear you tell it about a... Uh, museum that was trying to market itself to people in nearby office buildings and what creative solution the uh, successful marketing firm used for that yeah no indeed i mean i i, I wish i could i wish i could find the origins of the story because i was told it's in one of my first right it might be apocryphal but it's so good <laughs> yeah, yeah indeed yeah, and the, the, the story goes three agencies were asked to, to persuade local parisians to go to this museum uh, during their lunch breaks because the museum wasn't getting the traffic from local populations and two agencies came back with huge ad campaign pitches and bus sides and out of home and DM and text messages whatever else it might be in their channel arsenal uh, to make the most of the, the wonderful artwork in this museum and the third agency looked at the problem they looked at uh, the geography they looked at the audience and they looked at uh, what was on offer um, and they told the museum that they should build a bridge because it was too far to walk from the CBD to the museum in lunch break uh, unless they had a bridge going over the river. And I think there's, as an analogy, it's a wonderful one, true or true or not. It's a wonderful one about the lateral thinking that you can employ. Um, and I, I'd encourage any of your listeners to, to take, a, take a read of some of uh, Rory Sutherland's work. You, know, you read, um, uh, you read his, his books and they, they're littered with these examples of lateral thinking. Um, whereby problems that traditionally might be you know, attemptedly solved using you know, traditional marketing channels can be solved by looking at the problem in a mirror or through a lens or upside down or after a bottle of wine or whatever it takes to reassess what the actual nuts of the problem are. And, and I love those tales, and I, I think I, I learn a lot from them. But you don't, you're not giving us pure license to, as you say, you know, just go to whimsy. Um, you actually, I found it surprising to hear from a person that, you know, has the, the daring do that you have to say, you need to have some block and tackle things like a brand architecture book. What do you mean by that? 
Yeah, so but when I reference the brand architecture book, and this is my my own, my own language coming into play, um, it, it's it's literally the brand guidelines tied into the design style guide. And some people call them brand bibles. Uh, I call them uh, architecture books. Uh, I sometimes call them guidelines. But you know, it's the two parts of the puzzle. Uh, the first part being uh, the brand mission, positioning, personality, tone of voice, and then utilizing that once you've honed that down. You know, the coal is squeezed to become a diamond, then you use that diamond uh, as your brand design brief for your logo, color swatch, image style, video style, asset style, social media widgets. Um, and the two pieces come together. And then that's your that's your building block roadmap for how everything you create, every Marcom's campaign should look, sound, feel, smell, taste the same. And that consistency breeds efficiency. Um, added to that, if you do a good job of it, it should be exciting. It should give the scope to creatives, the scope to copywriters to really take the brand and deliver something to your audiences in a tone of voice, with a look and feel, in a style, uh, with a panache that they buy into, they get excited by. Um, and there's there's a lack of that excitement sometimes. You, know, you look at um, you look at how brands execute, and it, it comes down to this beige soup of mediocrity. There's too many people who have had their hand in the air going, oh, I don't like this bit, I don't like that bit. And the more of that committee that ends up having an influence in your brand book, um, the more beige the end result will be. It, it will lack the, like I said earlier, it will lack that ability to be stand out, to be exceptional. And that, that's, you know, that's the enemy, really. The enemy of originality is that mediocre, mediocrity by compromise. And so that, that's why I always go on about brand architecture process and how it's so important to have the right people involved in it with the right mindset and challenge to, to answer the right brief um, because it's such an influential part of everything and every spend you make for the next two, three, four years as a brand. Uh, so it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, the, I, we often think, you know, especially if we've been up late nights doing the difficult work of crafting a campaign that we're done when it just goes in market. And uh, you're reminding me though that we're not done. We have to defend it. I think of the story that you tell of Skoda, the Eastern European automaker. Uh, now, you know, a little bit of this is inference because you're imagining what it would be like to be a fly on the wall, but you know, tell our listeners what, uh, what you imagine they were uh, doing that, uh, you know, maybe they did have uh, the architecture all set. Maybe they did know what the message was, but they certainly had an uphill sell to do. Yeah, no, and I think the Skoda story, I'd encourage your listeners to, to go, and have, go and have a read of the background of that because, you know, effectively they were a nowhere car brand. Uh, they, were, they were vilified and joked about as being the worst of the worst. So arguably they didn't really have a huge amount to lose. I mean, they couldn't go backwards in terms of perception. Um, and I think that probably, again, you know, putting myself in the room as the fly on the wall, that probably gave them the right of license to go, well, you know, we're, we're currently nowhere and we can't go less than that. So what, what can we do? What are the options? And the decisions they made, it was a long term strategy and it, and it was something they were consistently executing against. It was it was absolutely um, brand changing for them, but they couldn't have done that as a standalone brand piece of work. It had to be driven through a product enhancement. Their product was the first stepping stone. They made the product decent. Right. Now, they went from a, a car brand that was um, was not well-liked and not considered to be quality. They enhanced the product. Now, as a, on its own, that wouldn't have been good enough. It still would have been the dodgy Skoda brand that no one wants to drive if they want their neighbors to think they're, they're successful in their career. Right. You, you said they'd they still put a Ford in the driveway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So one, once they had the product enhancements, that's when the opportunity came to then polish the brand. And because the brand's promise was fulfilled by the product's performance, that story held true. Once people started going in and test driving skaters and going, actually, it's as good as a VW. It's cheaper than a VW. It's as good. And I feel reassured. And the brand campaigns that they ran over a period of over five years, you know, it wasn't a one-stop shop. It was a, it was a long-term strategy. But the, the reassurance they got meant people wanted to buy these cars. The more people that bought them, the more people saw them on the roads, that then came a tautology. And then people rapidly, rapidly felt that they actually, they were made to look better 
because they were the early adopters that recognized the Skoda brand was good value and good quality. And they started, ironically, to get polished and gilded with the same the same credit that VW drivers or Mercedes drivers or Audi drivers used to get. Wow. So the whole story played out, you know, I'm guessing almost exactly as they wished it would. Sure. And the end result was significant uplift in car sales across multiple markets. Um, and it was it was a product and brand meeting of minds that went exceptionally well. But it required a lot of bravery because the way they stepped it up, yeah. you know, it could, it could have just been, if they'd soft sold it, if they'd compromised on any elements of it, I think it would easily have sunk. It would, it would have come across as, you're right, we're crap. Yep, yep, and, and it would have sunk without a trace. And so it's, it's a very good case study of assistance, patience, product and marketing having to be absolutely wedded together, um, the bravery to step out of the comfort zone, uh, the bravery of a client to follow a strategy all the way through. Because I don't know, um, for some of your uh, listeners who are in brand roles, if they, if they think to themselves, well, how many of our annual strategies have actually come to pass? How many have lived to go through to the end of the year and been pretty much what we planned in hmm. September or October the year before? And I guess that it's very few of your listeners who have lived that experience, which is kind of, you know, we get used to it. It's the standard in marketing. The we we, we draw, yeah, we draw military parallels with, you know, whoever it was who said that the battle plan never survives first contact with the enemy. <laughs> That's exactly it. And, yeah, and then the nature of it is your ability to be flexible, your ability to pivot is half the game. Right. However, you, that's not to say the original strategy is without purpose. The original strategy are the foundations on which these multiple stories of pivoting change are built. Um, and so, you know, but it's, it's a lovely dream of all of ours as marketers to have a scenario where we build a five-year strategy, as Skoda did, and it's brave and challenging and steps apart from anything seen before in automotive and then happens to come to pass and it works brilliantly i mean that's why it's one of my favorites as well is because i think it's one of the few examples where everything the stars aligned yeah um and everything came to pass and continued to do so over a long period probably because it worked so damn well you know if it hadn't done it wouldn't have lasted six months but it did and then they continued but uh it's, it's a it's a very encouraging story and there's a lot of key lessons to be learned in it I think one of the things that I take away from that story is an admission that we only have partial control of the brand because it wouldn't have worked if the public hadn't have also picked up on those sentiments and said, yeah, that's right. Um, and I I found in a few places you were encouraging marketers to think of ways where, you know, they they can say, all right, the brand isn't just what we say it is. Maybe we can give people more experience. Um, you've got a lot of background in the gambling and gaming industries, and you know you point to things like gamification as something that we should consider as part of our tool belt. Because if the buyer is actually considering their experience to be part of the reason why they buy or remain loyal to a brand, that is one of those areas that we have some leverage. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think yeah, the, the, the key to this is about, you know, there's elements of engagement, there's elements of entertainment, there's elements of fun, and, and I'll explain what I mean. Um, most marketing messages we execute, no matter how much we pretend otherwise, no matter how much we might fudge our data, most of them are ignored. You know, you look at any PPC campaign, you know, what's your, what's your click rate? What's your click to reg? What's your CTA? Yep. Um, you know, what's your conversion rate? And drop-offs and all those, if you looked at it in any other guys, apart from rose tinted got glasses, uh, you'd be horrified. Drop offs are astounding because people just don't want to see these out. They, it isn't the right time. They aren't your target customer after all. Your targeting is incorrect. They simply aren't in the market for what you're selling. Um, and the challenge of getting people to actually want to actively engage with you is one of the you know, absolute hidden gems to dig out. How can you do that better? Well, giving people what they want, allowing people to have fun, allowing people to engage on their own terms with your brand. Gamification in any guise, you know, by making a game of the process so that you entertain them as part of the engagement. Well, that's, you know, that's the dream ticket. Now, it's not feasible in every instance uh, for every channel, but it's certainly something I'd encourage you know, any brand to consider. You know, if we're having problems at any part of our funnel, 
what's going wrong. I mean, we normally try new creative, uh, new copy, new offers, yep. promotion tactics, whatever it is, the same, the same old stuff. But we have considered trying to make this a bit more fun for the user. And that's where the gamification piece kicks in. And, uh, you know, it, it, when you get that stuff right, when you actually do that, you don't have to put more money in. You don't have to bribe customers with money off deals. Um, you, you switch it on and it's better than it used to be. And it works better and more customers are engaged. Um, so in that respect, you know, that everyone should be happy. Yeah, and we don't necessarily have all the data points for this. Uh, that's partly, I think, also what you say that, you know, we can't imagine that the touch points, such as uh, pay-per-click, uh, form the totality of what that buyer is exposed to. Um, they could be, you know, getting word of mouth from friends. They could be yeah. doing all sorts of things to find out and inform their decision. We need to be um, aware of the fact that uh, they're going to form a truth in their mind and, you know, you, you come out boldly and say that, you know, we lie for a living. I think, I mean, t tell me if th there's a different interpretation of it, but mine is you're saying, look, there's the truth that the buyer uses to justify why they're going to take an action and your brand is there, you know, as long as the delivery is provided your brand is there to reinforce that truth that they have yeah no absolutely i think that this this raises an interesting point around you know, attribution modeling which is you know again something that's imperfect but absolutely a required part of any um, any sort of funnel management and yet yep. it's impossible to be 100 percent astute at it and I, I always sort of think it's funny that we go to a certain degree these days, you know, we're tracking and reporting capabilities that you can understand a certain degree of what can be attributed and U-shaped attribution within your funnel. Yeah. And yet someone like a Samsung or a, or a Nokia in the old days or an Apple with the iPhone, they could have attribution models that are fantastic. And it goes through from the initial glance and the sponsorship uh, they're done in sports perhaps. And then someone comes through to Google searches and the SEO kicks in and they see a PPC ad, they explore the model function. And actually, the reason someone bought this phone was because they were chatting to their mate in a bar and the mate showed them that the camera was really good. And that's the reason. Yeah. And we'll never know. Yeah. And, and this, or, this or they hold their mate in high esteem. Exactly. And, and this story could be repeated in any guys for any product and brand out there. What the attribution does is give us a better lean than, than the nothing we had previously. Um, but you've always got to assume there are higher powers at work that we simply haven't got an understanding of and then put ourselves in the consideration set. And I think this is the key thing for brands to understand is, you know, make yourself available, whether that's via distribution or via being socially available, you know, to your audience. Is this an acceptable product to have in your pocket or your handbag or your car? Um, you know, that availability piece is what opens up more doors. And the more, more doors that are open, ultimately, the more customers are able to walk in and make a purchase, yeah. which is what you want. Yeah. And that the... Arriving at the consideration set may be all that one particular tactic is trying to do because perhaps the counters get reset to zero as that person then takes that short consideration set and makes a final purchase. They're going to use different things at different points in their journey. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And you know, at, at which point, this is when this is when you sort of switch off from you know, your brand build and lastly your direct response. And the mantle passes over to your CRM. Yeah, that you've made you've made this wonderful leap where someone's actually put their hand in their pocket. They've they've got their credit card out. They've made a purchase. They're an incredibly hard thing to do to persuade someone to trust you enough to hand over their hard-earned money. At which point the real hard work begins. How do you engender loyalty? How do you engender retention? How do you mitigate churn? Um, and that's you know I've, I've used the analogy in the past about uh, you know um, a game of baseball. You've got brand build and uh, direct response yes. uh, being the outfield and the pitcher and the ball gets pitched in and it passes the bat and the glove is where CRM and retention catches the customer being the ball and then is responsible for them for the rest of, of their time. Um, and, you know, it really is that handing over the mantle from brand and direct response into retention. And what you do there, you know, we all know it's so much easier and better and cheaper to retain a customer than it is to acquire a new one. Yes. And yet so few brands, maybe because it's less exciting, maybe because the glamour's not there, who knows, but so few brands invest time, effort, money or skill into that retention process 
And that should be almost everything, you know, keeping a customer and it back to mobile phones, you know, getting them to, to buy this the next handset from you as the online retailer. That should be everything. You should be managing that relationship all the way through. Also understanding that it might be two years of their contract before they are considering purchase again. But that's your two year window. What are you doing yes. to engage, to entertain, to, to get, get, go on to the trust of the customer through that window to guarantee that they come back to you for the next purchase? At which point they'll probably be offered their favorite phone a little bit cheaper elsewhere. So you've got to get over the hurdle of price consideration because you might not be able to discount to that level at that time for that customer. Um, so those are some of the yeah. really interesting challenges from that hugely exciting, but perhaps less celebrated world of CRM and retention. And I think that's that you know, the marketer might make headlines and get garner awards and the acquisition and brand build side, um, but they make their living on the retention and loyalty side. Right. It, it, yeah. If, if they ignore it falls apart. Um, it, uh, it also, this brings us back to brand architecture. Uh, if you have said this handset is quality and that the experience that they're going to have will, you know, be something that will be lasting more than the price that they're paying, um, that informs your channels. Uh, you would be, you know, using something like a, uh, you're coming within 30 days of, you know, needing a new contract or a new handset. Uh, here's a, here's a quick little, you know, coupon and we're just going to drop our pants on price that, will come across as cynical and off-brand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's, let's face it, Glenn, you know, sometimes the, the price point is the required action. Right. You know, you can't customers, myself included, you know, we are looking at things, and if we're looking at like-for-like like products, yeah. one of the core considerations is simply price. What's it going to cost? It'll be cheaper over there. I'm going to go over there. And actually, I've never heard of that retailer, but quite frankly, I don't care. They, you know, yeah. The pilot says they're all right. I've heard of them. That's good enough for me. Um, and so the sort of dropping the pounds on price, sometimes that is the call. Not notably, the brands that invest most in themselves, the ones that are really good at it, and I, I'll call out the apples of this world here. Yeah. You know, how, often, how often do they need to drop their price? Well, mm. I, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's this one thing, and I'm not sure if it's a, uh, a British phrase for it, but you, you know, you talk about many different channels. You've already mentioned, you know, putting your name uh, in a stadium and you break them into above the line and below the, ca the line campaigns. Um, I yeah. take it, if I were to Americanize this, that's, you know, above the line is our out of the home and mass media, maybe traditional channels. Below the line is more of your digital. Yeah, effectively. I mean, um, yeah, above the line being the mass market ones, the way, the way I've described it in the past is the ones where you fire it out into the world and it's down to the customer to take, take down the inputs, to take down the messaging. I count as above the line. So that would be radio, TV, sponsorship, yep. out of home, and anything where there's an element of um, uh, direct targeting, which is obviously, you know, most of all of the digital channels outside of perhaps digital display in some guises, but the ones where you are targeting to some greater extent, I factor as below the line. Perfect. Let's delve below the line for just a minute here, because near the end of the book, you have, uh, I can only describe it as a somewhat dark um, chapter that, that uh, takes us into how, um, you know, when we're dealing on the turf of an Amazon, a Google, you know, Apple, Facebook, these, these monstrous uh, Silicon Valley companies, we, um, it doesn't matter which part of the ecosystem we're in. Um, we are all uh, seeing how they are slurping this data up and being merchants, you know, pushing it around to wherever it can be monetized. And you say, you know, we have to remember the internet is something that can be changed and that there have been for a while now, you know, people who have said, let's take it upon ourselves to take privacy into our own control, uh, be it ad blockers or, you know, go to Tor, you know, and, and go yeah. on the dark web and, you know, or blockchain and, you know, or dark social posts. These are all ways that people are trying to um, encourage something that just doesn't let the tech giants have their way uh, with us. And we marketers, 
we're in the middle um, because if, if it does, you know, if they do that to lash out at them, it robs us of data and we're literally in the dark. I, I'm interested, you know, we've had about a year now since, uh, you know, you maybe wrote that and I'd like to hear, you know, how do you feel about it today? Are you kind of optimistic or do you, do you think that uh, we are headed towards some large collision of these forces? Um. Yeah, do you know what, Larry? My, my, my take in general on these things certainly sides with the rights of the customer and the consumer, not least because as a marketer, whichever the way the rules go, whichever way the markets go, whichever way cookie tracking and data goes, as long as the playing field is level, i.e. as long as you and your brand and your competitor brands are all fighting in the same game, yeah. it shouldn't really matter. It shouldn't really matter. The rules change. It becomes more difficult to target. Data is less available. But it's less available to everyone. We all have to then push harder on brands, which arguably could be quite a fun and good thing to do. Um, that would be fine. It's when the goalposts are, um, are uneven for different teams, um, then that's not a, not a good place for marketers to exist in. I think um, you know, the powers that be in these giant companies, let's face it, they hold quite a lot of sway. Yeah. You know, they, are, they aren't exactly um, ineffective at their influence over the world as a, as a whole. Um, so I think this will worm its way into some form of compromise. Um, you know, we're looking at the cookie scenario now, which is yet to be fully defined. I think it probably will be yeah. um, because there's too much at stake for various people who, again, are very influential. Um, but I, I like to think that via the process of evolution, we'll come to a balancing point. Because like you say, you know, if people get so fed up with how much you know, data is held on them and how they are being used as a data point, um, then they do go down things like the dark web. I said it in the book, nothing good happens down there. (laughs) So I'd like to to think that there's going to be a sort of balancing or a reassessment of this, whereby customers are protected. They don't need to look at alternative options. No, we we all benefit from a a fairly even internet. um, And ultimately, for the benefit of the long term, I think certain things do need to be adjusted. You know, this hunger to understand everything about everyone at all costs isn't great um and i think we do need to understand the needs of the individual and the need, needs of the, the general public but um there's a very good quote that i i always refer to in the instances about about social media and the googles of this world you know if, if you're if you're using a digital media product uh, and you're not paying for it and you enjoy it then um then you are the product yeah um, and that's it's a very frequently used quote but it's it bears repeating yeah. um, because we do get all these things effectively free except for the access to our data which allows people to sell to us in more targeted ways and ad blockers are there we can use those we can not go online we can we can make these choices if we want to most of us don't choose these choices most of us just suck it up and accept lots of ads yep. and rarely click on any of them if i'm honest you know, yeah will support that um but, you know, that, that is, that's the nature of it. We get this wonderful, amazing, clever world of internet uh, with lots of crud attached to it. Um, and the crud is the reason it's free. So, yeah, I think we'll, 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 probably, get to a, we'll probably get to a place where um, someone clever somewhere will, will create versions of this that are less intrusive, uh, more people-centric, still allows targeting with uh, acceptable opt-ins, and everyone gets a little bit more happy about everything. Uh, if, I, if I was a... A more intelligent man, I'd love to invent that world and be right. hideously wealthy, but sadly I'm not. But I'm pretty sure people are working on it right now. Yeah, and whether it's one or many, that the pendulum is going to swing, as it always does, and marketers must be on top of those changes. Uh, we ignore them at our peril. For sure, and we, and we should hopefully be able to influence these changes, because it's through our through the budgets that we control on behalf of clients or brands that we run, this is the fuel that keeps the big tech and the big media fires burning. So we do hold influence as a collective, uh, and it's important to recognize that. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, we are seeing in 2022 here how uh, democracies in general, uh, that is a, a reminder that, you know, transcends just business and marketplaces. But if you, you know, see people that are acting together, um, the the numbers do start to actually make a change. So that's certainly a better future than where we all shrug our shoulders and say nothing's going to change. Yeah, true that. Harry, if people want to find out about the book or more about you, where can they go? Um, 
Well, if they'd like to, if they'd like to have a look at more about the background of the book, they can go to marketingbook.co.uk. Uh, my snappily titled lovely uh, book, book uh, website. Uh, alternatively, if they look on Amazon and search for brands, bandwagons, and bullshit, um, they'll be able to find it there. Uh, I've got it at a discount price now of. Uh, I think it's around two dollars for the ebook and uh, under ten dollars for the paperback. Yeah, and um, but, it, um, that's in Canadian. Uh, at least it was it was ten dollars when I looked. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, no, well, I, I'm, I'm not in this to make money, Glenn. I mean, it's right. designed for students and young people, uh, as well as those later in their career who are fed up of not understanding what the hell marketing does. So yes, I, I, I've, I've priced it to sell, not 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 to uh, not to be exclusionary. And that you have. Thank you so much for coming on, Harry. Thank you, Glenn. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope that people listening here have gotten a lot of value out of it. It's certainly an unvarnished look at our profession, but I think Harry does that. My own take is he is passionate about this. And if you have that, then you're willing to look at what you do, warts and all, and be able to share with other people so that they're going in with their eyes open. And I hope that you found something here that helps you make your funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.